banking union is the response to the crisis. Indeed, at this stage, it is the only remaining response to the crisis, as far as I can see. But it has been preceded by quite an array of earlier responses, and indeed uh, remarkable, I would suggest, uh, for Europe, which started off with a no bailout clause in the treaty. We now have a combined ESM, EFSF fund with a 700 billion bailout potential. So that's the first thing that changed in Europe. The EU response in terms of governance is also quite extensive. Um, there's a reformed stability and growth pact, known as the six pack. There's a European semester. Our budget recently went through it for the first time. It remains to be seen how effective it will be, but it's certainly a tightening up. And that's it, uh, it, one of the changes that it led to was our budget was in October rather than the traditional December because of the surveillance uh, process. There's a new macro imbalance procedure, which could be quite critical because this is very extensive, covers all sectors of the economy, uh, including balance of payments and credit, etc. And the Commission have said that had it been in place, the imbalances in Ireland, which we know led to all of the, the crisis and trouble that we experienced, they would have been spotted earlier. It remains to be seen, of course, uh, whether anything would have been done about them in the circumstances that existed at the time, but they certainly would have been highlighted. Then there's the two-pack, which is another governance uh, mechanism for, for Euro members. And finally, there's a treaty on the fiscal compact, which has been passed and which, to which perhaps not enough attention it has been paid in that it sets out a process for governing deficits and debt, and it, 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 indeed with an ultimate objective of reducing debt um, over perhaps a 20-year period to 60% of GDP. These, the, the, this crisis has been uh, different from earlier ones, even from the Great Depression, in that the central banks were much more active and interventionist. They did slash interest rates to zero, which never happened before. And not alone with that, they increased they did their balance sheets dramatically by providing funds and liquidity to the banking system, and in some countries by purchasing government debt. That wasn't on in Europe, given the limit, legal limitations of the ECB, but the, they, they did find their own way of dealing with it in the form of OMT, which is Outright Monetary Transactions, a program announced in mid-2012 by Mario Draghi, which is conditional on programs uh, being in place of, or surveillance of one sort or another, which has never been implemented, but which had a dramatic effect in lessening tension in the markets. And, but all of that was not enough. Why? Because fiscal fragmentation still remains. And I'm going to go on and speak, illustrate that for you in a moment. Uh, but banking union is the answer to getting rid of fiscal fragmentation, or at least mitigating it, and severing the link, which was referred to a couple of times already, between that link between governments and banks, and more on that and on. Now, fragmentation has, is multifaceted. Um, I suppose the first slide here shows the withdrawal of core banks from uh, advancing credit to periphery countries. And the periphery countries are shown there. You can see them in different colors. Now, Ireland is not green, unfortunately. I didn't do this graph. Ireland is in red. It's the one towards the bottom. Now, there are two things I would suggest to note from this. Well, first is the scale of the increase up the mountain, and there's the scale of the decrease. In total, their exposure to the periphery has fallen from 1.6 uh, trillion to just under 800 billion, and it halved. If you look very closely at the red block, which is Ireland, however, you'll find that it has reduced not by half, but by two thirds. And Italy did reasonably well. Italy's the green one. There's still a fair old exposure to Italy. So that's the first one. Um, <clears throat> here we have credit in its many forms. There is a shortage in the periphery of credit, both in absolute terms and also the cost of it is greater than elsewhere. This is the quantity here, and there are two things from this slide. Well, the green line here, I did do this chart so you can see Ireland in green. Um, the green line here is Ireland, and you can note the reduction in the quantum of credit is greater and earlier than most of the other peripheral problem countries. In fact, it was quite extreme. This is a broad private sector credit, and um, you will see that in the meantime, we've been joined by countries like Spain and Portugal who are now experiencing rates of contraction in credit, which are greater than Ireland. But to contrast that with the core, which in this case is represented by Germany and France, where well, you will see that credit is more or less unchanged to slightly positive. And that's one of the issues, uh, that's one of the problems of fragmentation, which is hoped banking union will do something about. The, the other one is the rate paid. This is um, loans up to one million, new loans up to one million, Typical of what an SME, a small company, would, 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 would borrow. 
And you can see here again, these are spreads over Germany. It's the percentage difference to Germany. Indeed, if you look back, Ireland at one stage was borrowing slightly, or borrowing rates were slightly lower than Germany. Uh, now they're a good bit higher. There are three camps here. Portugal, Vitor Constancio's country, fares the worst. With It's paying more than 3% above Germany. Then we have a group in the middle with, with Ireland and Italy paying roughly 1.5% more. And, fi and finally, you'll see that France has done rather well they're not paying anything extra. They're getting the same deal as Germany. I cut it very quickly here. House purchase loans, similar story, although the spreads are not as big. We're paying, you know, between half and 1% more for our new house loans and mortgages than Germans are. Here are the bond yields. This is another manifestation of the crisis. Been a big change. Before EMU, there were spreads. The cost of funds to government in, in, in countries as compared with Germany, and again, this is the percentage over bonds, uh, was, was high, higher, and EMU was all about reducing those spreads. Then we had the collapse of spreads to virtually zero, and now you have the crisis, and you can see what has transpired. Just take Ireland for a moment. They hit 10, the spreads over bonds hit 10%. They're now down to one, set, one and three quarters, approximately, and that is the correction to which Minister Noonan uh, referred to. But they are still there. And what question over banking union is, will it eliminate those spreads or not? Most of us think that risk will be priced differently in the future and that the cost of borrowing to governments in the periphery will be higher than in Germany for the foreseeable future. I'm not going to dwell with this. This is the pernicious triangle, which Minister Noonan referred to earlier. And I, I, if you want to ask questions, you can in the Q&A. So what's happening? I mentioned Basel too. Basel is where the rules on bank capital are set and then they're implemented across the world uh, by the various um, administrations. Two things to note here. The quality of capital has been improved because uh, there was uh, a fair bit of, uh, I wouldn't like to call it rubbish, but there was very poor capital on banks' balance sheets, which was being counted as capital. And the quantity has changed. And one of the figures for Europe, for example, is that um, since in recent years, since the stress test started, about 225 billion of extra capital has been raised by banks. It does put the European ratios on a par with the United States. There is, we're as good on average. We don't get the credit for that. Why? Well, there are still some gaps, and you'll probably hear Alan Jukes talk about that later in a moment. Um, not every bank it ha has, has, has the, the full capital ratios, but a lot has been done. There are other things, such as leverage ratios and liquidity ratios as well. To come to banking union proper, most people think it has um, three components, uh, and it's sitting on a fort. The three components, as has been mentioned already, are the single supervisory mechanism, affectionately known as the SSM, the single resolution mechanism, the SRM, and the green block here, which is deposit guarantees, which is a slightly more controversial and hasn't been mentioned yet today, as far as I can recall. Certainly, um, Mr. Constancio didn't mention it. Um, and there was a feeling at one stage that you needed a common deposit uh, mechanism, deposit, common deposit insurance with a backstop at Europe to complement the other two. But that part of the procedures has been dropped. And we'll come back to that later on as to what is going to be substituted for it. But in essence, it involves the national governments will backstop their deposit guarantees in the way that the Irish one does at the moment. And finally, underneath those three is the single rule book, which predates uh, the, the banking union. And it's basically a harmonization of the rules, governing bank supervision, governing definitions of capital, etc., etc. Now, um, I want to mention here that, uh, you know, one, one of the issues which we will come back to again and again today is the gaps in banking union. Because for Ireland, we came to the conclusion early on in this group that the fuller the banking union, the better it was for Ireland. The greater the chance of re reducing the fragmentation I showed you a moment ago, the better the chance of leaving the cost of credit for banks on an equal footing, as the Minister Noonan said, and the better the chance then the borrower would, of equal credit would experience a equal access and interest rates on credit. So the, to the extent that there are gaps left in banking union, this may not be achieved. So it is important that fragmentation be rolled back and eradicated. And the single rule book is a key way in which the, those gaps are being eliminated, not perfectly, as we'll see later, but uh, certainly a lot of progress is being made there. And that's under the auspices of the EBA, to just have another acronym, that's the European Banking Authority, a new body which was set up in 2011 as an early response to the crisis. Now, what is the single supervisory mechanism? <clears throat> 
Well, at the risk of repeating what others said, um, it's basically the elevation of supervision from the national supervisors to the centre, to the European Central Bank. This happened because there was a provision in the treaty which allowed that happen. Otherwise, a new, new treaty amendment would have been required. It's perhaps unfortunate that the ECB is not the ideal place for it. A new body, separate, like the EBA, would have been better. But there are certain conflicts within the ECB, and a complicated structure has been evolved to get over them. In principle, it covers all credit institutions in the euro area. That's 4,400, not 6,100, as used to be said. But the ECB will directly supervise only, well, 128 according to its latest document, which is, however, 85% of the assets of the banks in question. And a bank is deemed to be significant if it meets the following criteria. Its assets exceed 30 billion. Its assets exceed 20% of GDP and 5 billion, to rule out the smaller ones. It's deemed to be significant either by the national supervisors or by the ECB in a cross-border context. It has requested or received aid from one of the bailout funds, such as the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, or the EFSF, which we got money from. We didn't get anything from the ESM, but we got money from the EFSF. And the other 4,300 banks uh, will be supervised by the national supervisors, but under the control of the ECB, which has formal legal responsibility. And that's an important distinction. Now, the supervisors, I should say a word for them, God bless them, they are a big part of the problems that arose in Europe because they didn't supervise their charges rigorously, and when the crisis broke, instead of cooperating, which was envisaged under the mechanisms that then existed, they withdrew, they circled the national wagons, and uh, as was said earlier, looked after their own banks, which added greatly to fragmentation and caused many rifts in Europe. You only have to think of the resolution of, say, Dexia, one of those banks which had branches in multiple countries. There was no mechanism for doing that, and all the old nationalisms came into play. Uh, a brief word on the complicated mechanisms. The Single Supervisory Board is part of the ECB. I'm not going to go into it in detail. Um, it has, but the Governing Council has the ultimate say because it is in the treaty is the deciding body. But there is a complicated accept-reject procedure to get over that. Now, banking union, the, to get to the meat of the matter, I think it has short and longer-term implications. And in some ways, the shorter-term ones might be as important, or perhaps even more important, than the longer-term ones. And that's because the ECB, we had stress tests run by the EBA, the European Banking Authority. They were not a good experience because banks which had been stress tested, including banks in Ireland, failed shortly after they were tested. So you have to say why was that? Did they get the correct information from the national supervisors? Were the EBA incompetent? No, the verdict on the EBA is quite positive actually and there's a major uh, assessment going on at the moment. So the history is bad, therefore the ECB are determined to take over the banks with a clean bill of health. To this end, they're going to test them comprehensively over 2014. And indeed, the Irish, Ireland is ahead of the game here. Our tests have already begun, and the first results were announced actually overnight. Now, the test that will have, uh, there will be three parts, a supervisory risk assessment, an asset quality review, and stress tests, as we know them, by the ECB and the EBA. Now, I've said the history is bad, so the ECB is basically going to clean up the stable, and the question arises, how, what will the fallout from that be, and how will it be dealt with? And I could spend a lot of time uh, dealing with that, but I'm going to leave it for the moment, because there'll be a panel discussion in a moment in which we'll be able to go into that in greater detail. To move on to the second element of uh, banking union, this is the Single Resolution Mechanism, or SRM. Again, it's complicated. It was difficult to find uh, the legal basis in the treaty is interesting, and you will have a... Uh, an expert here to discuss that with you in a moment. But the, the result, this is what the result broadly looks like. A new single resolution board to be established. This is a sort of an advisory body in Europe. It will, have, it will interact with the Commission, which will have a, a reinforced role here. And it will also have a single bank resolution fund funded by levies on the banks, as you heard earlier, up to 1% of covered deposits. And building up, that fund building up to 55 billion over a period of 10 to 14 years. Now, um, the key here is the role of the European Commission. Because the European Commission, the board will make uh, recommendations, but the European Commission will decide. 
In other words, if a bank is in need of resolution, if it needs extra capital, if it's in danger of failing, if that fail would have systemic implications Europe-wide, and we know that even a small bank like Dear Old Anglo-Irish can have a systemic implications, uh, it don't have, doesn't have to be a big bank to do that, uh, then this procedure will come into play. And the recommendation will be made to the Commission, which will take the decision, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Meanwhile, on this fund, uh, I don't, I've probably said as much about it as I want to at the moment. How would the SRM work? The ECB would notify the Commission, the Board, and the National Resolution Authorities that a bank was in distress. The Single Resolution Board will then assess if it's a systemic threat and that there's no adequate private sector solution. Private sector solution would involve raising money uh, from various private sector sources, which could be uh, the shareholders or it could be additional bonds, etc. If so, then it rec the board will recommend the Commission to trigger resolution, as I've said. So that's a key new role for the Commission. Now, that is not without controversy. Some countries don't like, think the Commission is getting too big for its boots. They don't like the idea of the Commission. For example, it's often said, uh, no French, uh, no, no one's going to terminate Paribas, or the only one to terminate Paribas would be a Frenchman. So the idea of having someone in Brussels say that your cherished bank uh, is, uh, needs to be resolved uh, is not uh, attractive in some quarters, especially in Germany, it, it should be said. So there is some debate still over that, and it's not clear that the Commission will end up being the deciding authority. There's a proposal that it could be closer to the Council, which I believe to be legally feasible, uh, and possibly involving the national uh, competent authorities, that is, the national supervisors. This would be far from ideal from our point of view, in that it would mean that banking union would be less full, as I said earlier, and the chances of fragmentation continuing would be much greater. But that, anyway, is the proposal at the moment. Um, a very quick slide on the implications of a uh, resolution. You can see the basic thing, what, basically what it does to banks is it shrinks them. And you can see where the, the shrinkage occurs. It's mainly in, 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 in the bank's investments, which in a crisis situation uh, get depleted and diminished. And on the other side of the balance sheet, new equity has to be found. So debt, that is bondholders, and we heard a lot about junior bondholders here in Ireland during the crisis, their debt is now, will now be converted into equity. So the bond bit of it will, will diminish. And, and of course, people who thought they were just lending money to a bank in return for a very good interest rate could end up in owning share capital, shares, in something with perhaps a rather dubious value on the shares. So that's the issue. I mentioned the single rule book. Um, it is supporting all of these three blocks above it, the three blocks being the supervision, being the resolution, and being the deposit insurance. Um, and it's, it's wor they're working away on that. The aim is the level playing field, the, uh, but mitigate arbitrage opportunities, etc., etc. Now, there are gaps in the single rule book, and um, I, I want to mention them in a second. But first, uh, the timeline. From here on out, there's a lot still to be done, as Minister Noonan said. Um, I won't spend much time on this other than to note the legal framework now, the SSM, it's down there as autumn. It's now likely to be November, early November, when the ECB will take over. Between then and 2018, things will be controlled. You'll also have the resolution mechanism coming into place with a directive under it, which I haven't talked about, which is the BRRD, the Bank Resolution and Recovery Directive. It's part of the whole thing. You will have a complicated bail-in structure over that period, and that's the, the, the transitional one, if you like, because there are very specific rules under the BRRD which will come into force as, if, as planned in 2018, 1 January, and they will allow for bail-in not just of junior bondholders, but also senior bondholders, and in certain instances, depositors. Uh, but that is not scheduled to happen until 2018. In the meantime, the state aid rules will apply, and they, allow for, they now allow for bail-in of junior bondholders and shareholders, of course, as has already happened in Ireland and indeed in many other countries. So that is the, 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 the regime in the interim, uh, um, and the state aid rules will continue to apply. Now, bail-in, good and all as it is, and... It will provide a lot of money in the future, and it may deal with most or nearly all of the crises that arise. Um, it might not be enough if you had a systemic crisis of the likes we've had recently. That, I would add, is a once-in-a-century crisis. But in that case, you might need a backstop. And where would that backstop come from? 
That backstop would have to come from Europe, and it would be from the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism. And already 60 billion has been earmarked for this purpose, but there is some controversy over that, and it's still under debate. But that's all I want to say about the timeline. I want to finish up now with the long-term implications. And I suppose the way to summarize this is to say that banking union is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for the single market. In other words, it's a critical step on the road to getting the market back, on the road to reducing fragmentation, but it may not be enough in itself. Sovereign bond yields, for example, it's unlikely that the differentials or spreads will go back to zero over bonds, so there will be a gap there. Um, the single market will only, there's a problem, the single market applies to 28 countries, Banking Union will have the Eurozone, which is 18 from next January, plus ones who opt in voluntarily, say maybe f another five or six. Uh, in other words, it won't be the full 28. So there is a, a schism between the SSM countries and the total EU, with the, e with the EBA responsible for the whole lot in a sense, but there's a risk of further fragmentation between the ins and the outs, and that of course is bad for the single market. I said I'd come back to the gaps in the directives, and there are gaps. Uh, the national supervisors and regulators are fighting a determined rearguard action. They have succeeded quite a few uh, laxities and opt-outs. One, for example, would be the definition of core tier one capital, which you would think was important. The initial proposal in Brussels was for that to be decided on by the European Banking Authority. In the end, it's the national supervisors who will decide what constitutes core tier one capital. There are others on the macro prudential area, important to have macro prudential. That means if the housing market is overheating in Ireland, the central bank has the ability to tighten up, but it could be abused to ring fence national banks. And there are discretions on in the resolution area as well. So gaps and discretions are an important part of this uh, whole thing. And the biggest issue, however, is the question of who pulls the trigger. Will it be the commission or will it be the national supervisors again operating through the council? And that would be a bad day, a bad deal, I suggest to you, if that were to materialise. So they're the type of things we're watching. Finally, the consequences for the Irish banks are, could be important. There have been lots of consequences already. But um, to the extent that fragmentation remains, the cost of funding to Irish banks will be higher than otherwise. And therefore, the cost of borrowing from an Irish bank will be higher than otherwise. This has two implications. It's bad for the profitability of the banks. And it's also bad for the borrowers and for the economy. The peripheral economies would continue to suffer, perhaps to a much diminished extent, but nonetheless, higher borrowing costs, which has a negative connotations for economic activity in the periphery. From the banking perspective, it could obviously uh, lead to changes in banking structure, which interestingly were, were referred to by Vice President Constancio this morning, the first time I've seen this referred to by a, an ECB uh, spokesperson. Clearly, there will be implications for structure. In a way, this is an opportunity for the big banks in Europe. The ones who are still standing should have the greater firepower. Now, for the moment, they're not doing anything about it. That's for one of two reasons. It's either because they're nervous and have withdrawn into their national shells, or possibly also because their national supervisors are still telling them to stay national. But you could expect that to change in time, and that might lead to consequences. And I think on that note, I'll stop. Thank you.